welcome everyone, um, as he said, to the Mandatory Declassification Review Forum. I will now hand things over to Bill Carpenter, Senior Program Analyst. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the 2023 NCR Conference here, here at, the, at the National Archives. <laughs> so so we've got a room full of people here in the Jefferson Room. We've got people participating remotely through the WebEx program. Uh, we have our ISU director, Mark A. Bradley. We have a panel of government MDR professionals. We've got William Burr from the National Security Archive, and we've got a period of questions and answers at the end. So we'll be taking questions from you all. We'll be taking questions from the remote participants, and we'll be running right up until until 2.30. I'd like to start by introducing Mark A. Bradley. Mark A. Bradley is the has been the director of ISU since 2016. He serves as the Executive Secretary of the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel and the Public Interest Declassification Board. Uh, he's the chairman of the National Industrial Security Program Advisory Board and a number of other boards that are just as important. Previously served as the director of FOIA, Declassification, Pre-Publication Review of the National Security Division in the Office of Law and Policy at the Department of Justice. Uh, while at the department, he served as the Deputy Counsel for Intelligence Policy and the Acting Chief for Intelligence Oversight. Before jo joining DOJ, Mr. Bradley served as a CIA Intelligence Officer and Senator, Dan Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan's Legislative Assistant for Foreign Affairs and Intelligence Matters as his last Legislative Director. He co-drafted the legislation that established the Public Interest Declassification Board. Mr. Bradley remains a member of the District of Columbia Bar, worked as a criminal defense lawyer at the District of Columbia, Defending Indigents Accused of Serious Crimes. He's an author. The Society of History, the Society for History and the Federal Government awarded him a very principled boy, a very principled boy, his biography of Soviet spy Duncan Lee, its 2015 George Pendleton Prize, for the best book written by a federal historian. And the personal, uh, my personal favorite is Blood Runs Cold, his 2020 book on the Yablonsky murders and the battle for the United Mine Workers of America. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Washington Lee, holds an MA in modern history from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, JD from the University of Virginia, and he's retiring in June. So with that, he has some comments, which, which I'm excited to hear about what's happening in declassification and uh, is one of his final acts. Thanks for thank you. Thank you, Bill. Gracious introduction. Yeah, I spent most of my federal career on boards, so you can take that for what it's worth. I mean, it's not, um, anyway, uh, Thank you all for coming. We started doing these in 2017, I think, and uh, yeah, they were running quite well, and then COVID hit, and then we got knocked off uh, our wheels as so much else did the federal government. So I'm delighted to have these back. We, we started them because I thought that the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, the ICAP, is one of the crown jewels of declassification. And if it's about openness, then you all should know more about exactly how it operates and, and you know, its inner workings and also its challenges, especially the, uh, the latter. You know, I've been involved with the ICAP now for 20 years. I was the DOJ's sitting representative. I've been the uh, acting chair for a number of years and now I'm the executive secretary. So I've got a pretty good idea about what it does. And I can honestly say this, that I have never been around a more hardworking group of public servants and the liaisons who actually staff the board. They, they do most, most of the work. And I, I can, can say this, uh, you know, as a, not only as an as a executive secretary, but also as a taxpayer, that I've never seen a, a, a group who's more dedicated to its mission. And I, uh, I think we're all very lucky to have such uh, first-rate people. In fact, several of them are sitting in, in this room. That said, uh, as wonderful as the ice cap is, it's got challenges. It's got massive challenges. Uh, right now, the backlog sits at about 1,200 cases. Interestingly enough, about three requesters are responsible for three quarters of the backlog. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because I think when the, the authors of the executive order that created the ice cap never envisioned it being a, a uh, how can we put this, a cottage industry or a monopoly for just a handful of requesters. I think it was meant to be much bigger than that and play a much bigger role than that. Um, you know, originally it started out as, as uh, you know, a, an opportunity to uh, mostly get documents out of presidential libraries. And then as FOIA declined, I don't mean 
decline, decline. I mean, it became more absorbed by so many applications for FOIAs and also so many court cases that MDRs became a more viable way to get material. And actually, frankly, you have a better chance of getting releases under MDRs than you do a lot of FOIAs. Um, so I take my hat off to the savvy requesters who have found that route. The problem is, though, it's, it's, it's become, again, a captive audience for, and we spend a, a lot of resources and a lot of time serving a very small community. I, uh, as Bill said, I mean, my time is running short. I, I'll, I leave my federal uh, service on June 30th and retire, and I promise never to file an MDR or a, a, another FOIA. Don't take records with you. I, I won't. <laughs> no, I don't, only, only thing I'm taking from my office is this cup. Uh, so you won't be looking for me. But that, that said, I mean, how do we uh, make the ice cap into what I, I think it, it, it should be? One obvious reason, or one obvious reason, one, one obvious uh, answer to that is to get it, give it more funding. It, it takes its money out of uh, NARA. It takes and, and goes to NARA, then it goes to ISU, which I'm the director of, and it takes its money out of ISU. Now, we, we provide the, uh, most of the administrative support for it. I would like to see agencies who sit on the ice cap actually contribute uh, more in terms of resources and funding to actually support it, especially in, in technology. Bill and, and the ice cap uh, liaisons have made tremendous strides in using other agencies' technologies. We've been able to actually do some of our meetings remotely. And I think, Carrie, I think if I'm right, the ODNI actually has hosted yeah. some. Seven. So, I mean, yeah. we're, we're reaching in, into more of, a, of an us instead of just, just uh, ISU uh, doing this stuff. But funding is critical. Now, again, I don't have to tell you where we are as we rush towards the debt ceiling. Uh, you know, even the uh, you know, generous interpretation is going to be one hell of a fight down to the finish. Uh, and if, and if, if one side has its way, you'll only get a 1% increase in funding for the entire federal you know, agencies across the board. That's not going to carry the mail for NARA or, or the, uh, the ice cap. But if uh, we do get, get uh, how can I put this, a, a more clear-eyed view of the problem. Um, again, there's been, since I've been involved in this, uh, this kind of work, I've never seen such scrutiny as this past year over classification and declassification. And some of it's because of Mar-a-Lago, some of it's because of what's happened in Delaware, but it's, it's brought a lot of attention to it. And especially up on the Hill. Now that's good and that's bad. Some of the ideas are better thought out than others, but almost uh, the first question I get whenever I appear before one of the committees up there is, what do you need to do your job more effectively? And of course, that's the old, old bureaucrat's answer. I need more people and I need more money, right? So we, we need that. We need more, more technology. More uh, systemically, though, uh, there is a move afoot. It started last June uh, to overhaul, reform, uh, change Executive Order 13526. That's where the ice cap is is located. That effort has, has uh, is still ongoing, uh, not as quickly as I would like, uh, but it's still still out there. And I have uh, told uh, the NSC in my annual report to the president, I'm telling them again in this, my last annual report, I'd like to see the ICE CAPS authorities changed. I'd like to see it have the ability to refuse to take cases. Right now, most of its cases come uh, from federal agencies who fail to honor the time, commi the, the time commitments that they're supposed to address appeals. And quite frankly, there's no incentive under the order for them to do that. There's no punishment. There's no downside to that. So... It seems to me well, the ice cap should be like the Supreme Court, having the ability to turn down cases. I would like to see it focus on cases of the highest public interest and of the greatest historical significance. I would like to see it become a board whose decisions have precedent. And once they are decided, that's it. They are just like the Supreme Court decision. They are the law of the, the, law of the land in declassification. So we're not going to relitigate this again. These decisions have been decided, and that's it. Done. Finished. Game, set, match. I would also uh, like to see something that I have fought for for a number of years, and I, I go back and forth on his chances, but I would like to see a member of the public sit on the ice, ice cap. And that's a pretty radical idea. 
That member would be somebody who's willing to go through a full background check, just like the rest of us who have clearances, who sign a uh, non-disclosure agreement, and who are willing to abide by that agreement. But to come in for the purpose, and maybe only a limited purpose, of helping the ISCAP decide what historical documents were the greatest significance for the American people to know. And I don't think that, that as, as good a job as the government historians do and, and the government uh, representatives on the ISCAP, that we couldn't benefit from having the public weigh in more on what the American people should know. I think it would elevate trust in the board. And I think that it would uh, add a, a fresh set of eyes to a different kind of, of, of problem. I mean, I, 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 way back when I used to practice in front of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and even that court now uh, has cleared lawyers from the, the bar who come in and uh, argue special cases or, or special points before the court. And these lawyers, as I say, go through the background checks, they sign the NDAs, and they are of enormous benefit to the court to bring another perspective in on the Fourth Amendment. Why we can't do that in the ice cap on historical records, I don't see why we couldn't. I think it would be a real step forward. Now, the devil's in the details. Who would that person be? How would you select that person? Would it be somebody from the American Historical Association? Would it be from you know something else? I don't know. Those, those are granular details that luckily I'll be down in the Shenandoah Valley and not going to have to worry about. But anyway, I, I, I would hope that, that that idea of having the public participate more in the ice cap would be something that would gain some uh, traction. I've, I've never uh, lost my fundamental belief in the American people as arbiters of their own future and their own constitution and their own liberties. And I think probably the best way to do that is to get them fully engaged in the process. So with that, I bid you adieu. Uh, I've had a really interesting career, but I'm ready for something else. <laughs> and uh, with that, Bill, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Before we get to our panel uh, of agency MDR folks, I'll give you an ice cap update. So ice cap has been working away throughout the pandemic. I'll give you an idea of what we've done, what's coming forward, and what the issues are now. For those of you who don't live, sleep, and breathe, ice cap is the interagency security classification appeals panel established under executive order 13526. Six members plus one, but plus one is CIA. Six members uh, starting around the table where we meet every month. Department of Justice, Central Intelligence Agency, State Department, National Security Council, National Archives, Office of Director of National Intelligence, Department of Defense. Four functions and four functions only. It's unusual for a week to go by where I don't get a question from somebody in the world asking the ice cap to do something. We have four functions established under the order. Appeals of classification challenges. Authorized holders of classified information are expected and encouraged challenge the classification of information coming across their desk. The highest appeal level is the ice cap. Only a handful of these come our way each year. Declassification exemptions. An original classification authority out there in the government has the authority to classify information for 25 years. Keeping the classification of information beyond 25 years requires approval from the ice cap. This is expressed in the form of a declassification guide. Mandatory declassification review appeals. What we spend most of our time on. What we spend most of our time today talking about. And then the fourth function, appropriately inform the public and senior agency officials of ice cap decisions. There's the provision in the in, in section three, agencies using, uh, shall consider the decisions of the panel in conducting reviews under automatic, systematic, and mandatory review. So as a result, it's important for the ice cap to make its, its decisions known. We do that through a website. We post, five of we post um, Americans with Disability Act compliant versions of our declassified documents as we can. We also have status law. So those of you can, everybody can download every quarter an updated listing of each active appeal that the ice cap is dealing with. Productivity, 2020 to 2022. I returned to the ice cap staff in the summer of 2020 after a detail at National Security Council. For about a year and a half, I was the only person allowed to come into the office. We processed ice cap appeals electronically with agencies also who had limited time in, in their classified areas to do work. 
but we did it. 2020, we processed two appeals, three documents, 214 pages on Soviet space and an Air Force oral history. And completely remotely. 2021, another remote year. Six appeals, 43 documents, almost 2,000 pages, including significant releases from 9-11 Commission, from the Center for Legislative Archives, a collection in this building. A history of telemetry also out of the National Security Agency. How do we know about Russian rocketry? Through telemetry. 2022, a time where we were getting back into in-person in meetings as well as coordination electronically. 21 appeals, 137 documents, and over 1,700 pages. Significant three appeals out of the Clinton Library. And we posted, we started to post these up on our own website uh, very recently, but they're also available at the Clinton Library. These are documents from the Clinton administration regarding Victor Boot, the, the Soviet arms trafficker, the Russian arms trafficker. Very interesting stuff. New stuff, stuff that we haven't dealt with before. DOD, intelligence community, National Security Council information. Bush Cheney 9-11 Commission interview, never released before. A sitting president and vice president talking to a presidential commission about the terrorist attacks in 2001. Very little redacted, very little redacted. High public interest in this one. Mr. Bradley talked about this idea of the ice cap focusing on appeals of high public interest. We've been trying to do that. The most important thing that we can do as ice cap staff is identify uh, documents that allow the ice cap to spend their time in the most impactful way. Outlook for 2023. So year to date, we've got decisions on nine appeals, nine documents, almost a thousand pages. Korea policy review from 1969. So President Nixon told the told his government review our policy in Korea. That resulted in a two volume work decided upon in two different appeals out of the Office of Secretary of Defense. Those are being posted as we speak. Hearts and minds. Oh, that's a particular favorite of mine. We spent a long time on that. And Carrie's, she's, she's shaking her head. Uh, it's a terribly important document. So this, of course, U.S. government agencies conduct, they, they, they have historians, they do classified history. This history is published in 1999 on CIA support to U.S. organizations, anti-communist organizations during the Cold War. Uh, National Student Association, American Friends in the Middle East, uh, entities like that. Very little has been officially declassified on CIA relationship to these organizations before. Now a lot more has. So you'll see that uh, that was released. Once, once hearts and minds go, oh yeah, 60 day appeal period. So that won't be released until the end of June. But the decision's been made. And unless an agency had appeals that decision to the president in the next 50 days, that will be released at the end of June. It takes a lot of time. 9-11 commission interview with Prince Turkey bin Faisal, Saudi intelligence chief classified confidential. As you can imagine, it's an interesting document. Some significant uh, foreign policy implications. But yeah, so the, the head of a foreign government's intelligence organization talking to a U.S. body about terrorist attacks in 2001. Not been released in any form. It will be released soon. So number of appeals remains low. We have seen, we saw in 2015, 16, 17, spikes in the number of appeals, valid appeals coming to the ice cap from a handful of requesters. Department of Defense command histories from decades and decades from combatant commands, from regional command. Every last one of these being requested, one year deadline hits, appeal to the ice cap, valid appeals. That stopped, we're not seeing that over the last, last couple of years, handfuls of appeals coming in. 2023 so far, eight appeals, Christian? Eight? Yeah, not very many. So the pipeline is, it's, it's as if appellants understand that the ice cap uh, should do what Mr. Bradley said it should do. Decide upon those, those appeals that really, really matter. Let the agencies, for example, continue to process those appeals, if it, even if it takes, those requests, even if it takes years. Number of unresolved appeals remains high. We still have our backlog. It's, it's in our spreadsheet. You can see where they're coming from and how long it takes. Our prioritization processes really haven't changed that much over the last several years. We post on our website the principles that the ISCAP staff use to prioritize appeals. We do care about old appeals. We do care about Mr. Revnitsky's appeal. 
from decades ago. Lewis B. Nichols files uh, requested when they were in the custody of FBI. They're now in the custody of the National Archives being processed by the National Declassification Center. His appeal is valid. His appeal is for the material that remains classified after processing. And we will work on that. We care about the type of requester. That one requester who really needs a document. That, that, that document that, that, that will, that's the key to understanding, let's, as an example, CIA support to U.S. anti-communist groups during the early Cold War. So, it has an impact not just for that requester, but for everybody who cares about U.S. cultural history. We look for appeals that have gone through the agency, the complete agency appeal process. Appeals that have come, they've gone through the CIA's review board. They've, what's come out, the, the request and appeal process, is as clean as the agency can make it. That's something that the ice cap will prioritize. Nonetheless, we do see appeals, highly complicated appeals, that haven't gone through the agency appeal process that we might prioritize. So it's a complicated, a complicated process. But it's what we get paid to do. Christian, next slide. Shift gears a little bit to declassification guide updates. This is of interest mostly to, to those agency people in the audience, those people who are responsible for conducting review, for automatic, mandatory, and systematic review. Those folks have known that the ice cap reviews declassification guides every five years and requires an update every five years for these milestones of automatic declassification at 25, 50, and 75. The requirement under the implementing directive to review this stuff every five years is a requirement for agencies to do that review, that agency internal review to make sure that you all understand your authorities and make sure you've got, you don't have new weapon systems that require an exemption authority. Agencies only need to come to the ice cap if you've got new exemption categories, you've got a new weapon system that's going to be due for automatic 25 or 50, new exemption milestones, you've got a program that's now turning 50 years old that's so sensitive it requires that extraordinary exemption at 50 and perhaps 75 years. And we know that that exists. Or agencies that haven't needed to have an automatic declassification program until comparatively recently. It might have only been founded 20 something years ago. So they won't need to do automatic declassification until their records come due for automatic declassification. Those are the people who need to come to ISCAP. The ISCAP has spent time in the last couple of months reviewing updates from the Office of Secretary of Defense and the Department of the Army, looking for new milestones, new exemption category elements that they need. So those have been approved. We will update our ISOO notice that lists those agencies that have exemption authority at these milestones. So OSD will be updated, Army will be updated, and perhaps others. So look out for that. Any questions, you can contact me about what your agency needs to do. We have an ISO notice that, that explains this, that explains that every agency does not need to come before the ice cap during this review cycle. So it's kind of inside baseball, but it has, it has implications even for the researcher community, because you all need to know what agencies have authority for exemption at these different milestones. We can be as open as we can. Next slide. Ah, uh, Mr. Bradley also mentioned that for the ice cap to have as much impact as it possibly can, its decisions need to have precedent. Its decisions need to be followed at agencies. Remember that fourth function of the ice cap, appropriately inform senior agency officials and the public of decisions. How will we know that the ice caps decisions have impacted agencies? They'll know through oversight. They'll know by ISU people going to agency programs, asking them if there's a process to incorporate ice cap decisions in their declassification guidance, asking them if they use these processes. For years, I and my colleagues at the Information Security Oversight Office had an oversight program for agency automatic programs. We collected information, we requested data from agencies about their auto D-class programs. We had trips to agencies, we looked into the work, we looked at the outcomes of the reviews, bad referrals, missed equities, things like that. Over a period, over a decade, that kind of, that oversight process improved automatic declassification outcomes at agencies. And I think agency people will agree that in 2015, the reviews coming out of agencies were better than reviews in 2005. An oversight program for mandatory declassification review processes at agencies will collect information about MDR processes, share best practices across the government for MDR, and 
encourage agencies through the oversight process to use ice cap appeals during their review. Now you'll see if you look into old ISU reports, this is the annual report of the president that ISU has been doing for a very long time. The ice cap report has always been a part of this, but the reporting of mandatory declassification review numbers, you'll see there's only ever a handful of big players. here. DOD, enormous player for MDO. This past year, 11,000 requests in 2022. It's 21. I've got the numbers. Uh, it, anyway, thousands and thousands. It's 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 orders of magnitude above others. National Archives is a big player, certainly because of the the, the uh, presidential library system, the National Reclassification <laughs> Center. Uh, below that, State Department, it's a big one. CIA, other agencies, handfuls, handfuls of numbers. So we'll only be we'll be focusing our oversight process on those agencies with significant MDR programs. So by definition, that will be in DoD the various entities under DOD, uh, State Department, CIA, and National Archives. That's our goal. That's a long-term process. And what we know from the oversight process is coming in like auditors or coming in like inspectors is not overly helpful. Working with agencies to gather information, understand what their concerns are, that's where oversight has its, much, has its most impact. So that's what we'll be doing. So myself and my colleagues will be contacting agencies this summer, gathering information about MDR programs and working out an oversight progress process for the coming years. Next slide. Ah, so agency MDR program, the panel. I, have, I am happy to introduce my panelists, if I can find my bios, which are over here. They are here somewhere, where the heck are they? Ah, here they are, right in front of me. Stephanie Oribore. In order, you'll be hearing this. Stephanie, she's the director of Archival Operation Division in the Legislative Archives, comma, Presidential Libraries, comma, and Museum Services Office of NARA. She's responsible for archival policy development and oversight of the Presidential Libraries and the Center for Legislative Archives, which includes supporting their declassification program. She's also responsible for the administration of the Gore, Cheney, Biden, and Pence Vice Presidential Records. She began her career as an archivist at the George H.W. Bush Library and has more than 20 years experience with providing access to presidential and vice presidential records. Moving down the line, Don McElwain currently serves as a supervisory archivist and director of the classified FOIA slash MDR division in the National Declassification Center, it's the NDC, and has since January 2010. He directs a staff that processes access demand requests for classified federal and transferred presidential records in the custody of the National Archives. He previously served as an archivist in several NARA units and began his NARA career as an archives technician in 1990. He served as an instructor for several courses, including managing the life cycle of national security information, the Modern Archives Institute, and the introduction to archives for archives technicians. Terry Lewis. Kerry currently serves as the Deputy Chief of the Information Management Office, the Office of, of the Director of National Intelligence. She has 15 years experience in information management, policy, and declassification, and has previously served at the NSC and the Department of State. Kerry served as the ICE Cap Liaison for five years, and in that time represented three agencies, Department of State, NSC, and ODNI. Finally, with J.D. Smith, I'm glad you, you made it on time. Thank you. <laughs> I was very worried. JD, John D. Smith currently serves as the acting chief of the OSD, that's the Office of Secretary of Defense, Records and Declassification Division. In his role as acting chief, he serves as the program manager for the OSD Records and Information Management Program and the OSD Declassification Program, which includes OSD Automatic Declassification Review, the OSD Joint Staff Mandatory Declassification Review Program, and the DOD Foreign Relations of the United States Declassification Review Program, and the DOD NATO Declassification Program. He's an information security, information access, and records management professional with over 15 years experience with the Department of Defense. Mr. Smith also serves as the DOD member of the U.S. delegation to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Archives Committee. We have a number of questions for you all that we'll talk about. Before we talk about the questions, what do you want to say about your programs? 
Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm here representing 15 presidential libraries as well as the Center for Legislative Archives. Um, our holdings include a vast number of collect collections, including presidential papers, vice presidential papers, donated collections, and the records of the United States House and Senate, as well as the records of legislative agencies and commissions. Uh, as a part of the National Archives, our core mission is to provide access to archival records um, entrusted into our care. NDR, Mandatory Declassification Review, requests are just one slice of the big pie that is access at the National Archives and at the Presidential Libraries and the Center for Legislative Archives. Um, however, it is a bigger slice at some of our libraries because it is the only avenue by which the public can request records um, at those libraries because they are donated collections. Um, but without diving deep into the different types of presidential records and the access rules governing um, House and Senate records, I just want to talk a little bit about how people request MDRs at the libraries and how that affects our backlogs and how we process those records. Um, for the most part, people are requesting records, uh, classified records and holdings at the presidential libraries and at the center of for legislative archives based on our withdrawal sheets. When um, archivists on staff have processed a series, a collection, and have identified material that is classified, instead of serving that, we of course serve withdrawal sheets. And our savvy researchers take the time, look at what's on in the open file, as well as those withdrawal sheets. And that really allows them to pinpoint key records that they are truly interested in versus more of a fishing expedition that you see with FOIA requests. But that's not the only way that our researchers are accessing and pinpointing records for mandatory declassification review requests. Uh, some of the libraries have proactively released their folder title inventories of key series and collections in their holdings. And what has happened is that researchers have gone and said, I want this folder and this folder, and that can represent hundreds of documents. And so what is one NDR request is a massive endeavor for the National Archives and the equity holding ed agencies to handle the declassification of. And then finally, though this is not the only three ways, there are citations in government reports that our um, researcher community rely on to also identify classified records for which they want access. So government reports like the 9-11 Commission report where the commissioners had pulled resources from across the government and then cited those in the final report we do have our researchers who sit down, open those reports, and are studying the footnotes, and will contact the Bush president, George, H, George W. Bush Presidential Library, as well as the Center for Legislative Archives to access those records. And so all of that to be said that we do have backlogs at the presidential libraries and at the Center of Legislative Archives. Some of those libraries have fairly small backlogs. Uh, the Obama Library has less than 10 MDR cases in its backlog versus the Reagan Library that has more than 7,000 cases in its backlog. And there's a lot that goes into that. One, as I mentioned, the, the ways that people access and they do not have a large portion of their collections available to the public, so there aren't withdrawal sheets for researchers to be able to then file MDR requests. And because of that sufficient specificity requirement of the MDR, that prohibits a lot of MDR requests versus a library like the Reagan Library that has a massive collection that they have done a, quite a bit of review and release. And so you have those withdrawal sheets and the file inventories. And so their MDR backlog is quite massive. But also what goes into those backlogs and what we definitely want the researcher community to understand is that we have um, very little onboard declassification guidance um, a, authority at the presidential libraries and at the Center for Legislative Archives. Even though we know that this information has, be de had, information has been declassified in some ways, 
we ourselves cannot take that authority without consulting with the relevant equity holding agencies. And for some of the records in our holdings, they are incredibly complex with multiple equities. And so instead of looking at a memo and saying, oh, I just need to re refer this to the State Department, get a response from the State Department, and then I can proceed with releasing, I look at a memo and I see that I have to refer to the State Department, to CIA, to OSD, to FBI, a whole gamut of agencies and departments. And so once we do that, those go into those agencies and departments backlog of consultations. And so it is just a cascading effect of the more equities, the more complex a record, the longer it's going to take for it to be go through the MDR process and then be produced. And there is one other thing that is very unique to our presidential libraries, Reagan Ford, and that is the Presidential Records Act. The Presidential Records Act was passed in 1978, and it affirmatively declared that records created by the president and his staff and the vice president and his staff are government records and are to be transferred to the National Archives at the end of the presidential administration. Part of that is that in the five years after the end of the administration, those records are not subject to MDR or FOIA requests. But at that five-year mark, we are accepting requests. And so we process them like we process other requests at other libraries. The one difference is that the Presidential Records Act requires a 60 working day um, notification period in which we inform the former representatives of the former president and the incumbent president that we intend to release records. And in that time period, they have um, an opportunity to review any records we're proposing to release and make a determination on an assertion of a claim of executive privilege. So on top of all of the process that we have to follow in terms of consulting and referring records to equity holding agencies before release, we also have that added notification period layered on top. So that also does affect how long it takes for an individual MDR request to be processed. And when you have a backlog of 7,000 requests, that becomes amplified in a somewhat frightening way for our researcher community. Um, but I, want, I say all of that to say that we have an incredible incredible dedicated team of archivists, archive specialists, and archive technicians who truly know these collections. And they have worked with them. Some of the archivists on our teams have worked with these collections for multiple decades. And so they really do want to partner with the researcher community to help them identify the records that are most salient to their research. Um, I, say that saying that that backlog that we're dealing with is not necessarily is not a reflection of the dedication and the commitment of the people who um, consider this their life work. And with that, we are now partnering with our colleagues at the National Declassification Center. In 2018, the National Archives decided to consolidate all of the classified holdings of the presidential libraries, as well as the vice president's records that are in that my office is responsible for in the National Declassification Center in College Park, Maryland. Um, the purpose of this was really to leverage the successes, the process and workflows that the NDC had established in addressing its automatic declassification backlog and turn that machine basically towards these collections. Um, and so in late 2019, we started moving those classified holdings from the libraries. And currently, and this is where I have fun, is trying to list all the libraries, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Ford, Carter, George W. Bush, Obama, and the Trump presidential records are all now at the NDC. Um, and Unfortunately, COVID-19 intervened because we had moves scheduled in 2020 to be with all of them to be complete at the end of the summer. Um, but we have now uh, resumed those moves and we anticipate that we will move the remaining holdings from the five libraries in my office to the NDC um, within the year. And I know I just said we have talented staff that are now going to be physically separated from their collections, but I will say that it is truly a partnership. And 
for those collections that have already been moved. We have worked very closely with the National Declassification Center. We have um, established firm lines of communication. We have also established SOPs to, deter to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks and the expertise at the libraries are not lost, is not lost as the collections are being managed and administered here um, in the DC area. Uh, we hope to build on that. And um, Don and I are <laughs> often in communication about the challenges presented by consolidation. But what I would say to um, the researcher community is that it is not a concrete wall now between the libraries and the NDC, and that we are working together to partner to move those backlog, reduce those backlogs as much as we can. Um, and one other thing to note is that you will still be going to the, you can still go to the libraries, you can still file your NDR requests there, and all of those records will be released at the libraries. It's not that they are staying here, and the thought is that this move of the classified holdings is temporary, and that once those records are declassified, they will be moved back to the libraries. And I just want to end this with speaking to your say whatever you want to say. I wanted to talk about the three wishes I had for declassification in NDRs. Um, the first one is a commitment of resources, uh, staff and technology to handling born digital classified records. I know that we have a lot of our backlogs that are re represented here are really reflective of textual records, but I, that is the tip of the iceberg. And we've been dealing with electronic records since the Reagan administration. And the fact that the archivist at the Clinton Library to handle a MDR for classified email have to print out an email, send it and refer it that way and serve it to a requester, that's problematic. We should be able to move our declassification process forward and what will what that takes is truly a commitment of time and resources to focus on that and not just the declassification process, but focus on it from point of creation and records management through um, the declassification process. The second thing is I would say just build on the communication channels with researchers. I just encourage the researcher community to see us as allies and partners in their research. Um, we are not trying to withhold anything. And what we are, our core is to connect people with records. And so really trust us that we are trying to do that to the best of our ability and the best of our knowledge and expertise. And then the final thing is more declassification authority for the National Archives. Um, the process I explained of identifying the equities and then having to refer all of those, refer records to all of those equities is time consuming and cost prohibitive in many ways. And I think that we can approach this in a smarter, um, more streamlined way. And that's all I have. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And um, I'll start out by saying it's been a really great learning experience and a great partnership working with our friends at the presidential libraries and in particular, Stephanie. Um, I think we, we were handed a big deal and then COVID came on. And as a result, you know, things got slowed down, but if it wasn't for the wonderful cooperative spirit between the libraries and some of the NDC staff, I think we would be a lot further behind. Um, again, I'm Don McElwain. I run the FOIA and MDR shop at the NDC. Um, our team's mission is, is similar to that of NARA, which is to process, simply to process access demands for security classified archival records. Um, how do we do that? Um, my vision and you know what I try to instill in my whole team is to build on the work of the NDC and now presidential libraries who have done systematic review to build on that work and to be recognized as honest brokers between researchers who have the right to ask for their government's information, especially historical archival information, and those equity holders. We want to be partners with the agencies as well. And again, we're looking at 
historical archival records. And, and I can't stress that enough that, you know, even the most recent libraries, even, even the Obama library, you know, these are records that are at least five years old. Going back to some of our federal records from even the late 40s and early 50s, going back to the oldest library that we currently have, and that's the Eisenhower Library, with hundreds of open mandatory re requests. You know, we, we would like to see agencies, when we send out consultations, look at those consultations through that historical lens. Um, the fact that ISU makes, you know, declassification guides available to declassification professionals, I think is a valuable, but possibly even underused tool in processing mandatory review requests for historical archival records. So my team currently is 12 archivists and archive specialists. I have two vacancies and we have been approved to hire five additional new people in the coming year. So that means 19 people when we're fully staffed to handle the backlog of federal classified FOIAs and mandatory review requests and presidential. And as, as Stephanie pointed out, we're on track to transfer those other big libraries. And those are some of those backlogs are substantial to process those. I see a lot of what we do as a service. Um, again, as Stephanie pointed out, we don't have a whole lot of authority to declassify anything. Um, I think one of the ideas behind the presidential consolidation was to leverage the resources here in the Washington area to allow our agency partners who have people on site in College Park, to if not make decisions on is this their equity to help us triage that. And again, in, in my Don's perfect world and a beautiful sunny day, we would not be sitting there at a copy machine or a CD burner sending physical media consultations to agencies. We would be able to send that through what's it term of art, the high side or classified networks directly because we're getting more born digital we're digitizing more born paper. This going back and forth, the print, scan, print, scan, is, is, a, is a waste of resources. Why can't, if I've got a document that needs to go to carry and to JD, why can't we leverage technology that exists to speed up that consultation? Why, if OSD has someone on site at Archives 2 already participating in the systematic review projects of the NDC that, by the way, make my life a lot easier. Why can't that person render a judgment on whether that really needs to go to OSD FOIA or whether that can be declassified? So th those, those are kinds of things that I look at. So. Our biggest two goals in the NDC classified FOIA and ma mandatory review shop this year is one, the same goal we've had for the last 12 years that I've been involved in this division, and that's to reduce our backlog of federal FOIA cases by 10%. We have met that every single year. This year is going to be a challenge as agencies are coming out of COVID and they have their own backlogs to manage as well. There was a time when my office was responsible for nine of the 10 oldest existing FOIAs in the federal government. We were able to clean that up. Now, my understanding is when Nixon and Reagan and Clinton FOIAs come to the NDC, Stephanie will be handing me back some of those 10 oldest of the federal Perhaps. government. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. But that's okay because we've already built this really cool relationship and have battle tested. She, she mentioned these SOPs. We had to develop SOPs before we had actual work going back and forth, and we have battle tested the SOPs. 
we've continued to improve on them. In fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting with all the presidential liaison, library liaisons and their partners at the NDC. So the good news for the research community out there is we talk to each other and we can hopefully help you narrow, refine your requests so you can get that out the door. And then the other goal that we had, which fortunately we've already met, is to log all of the transferred presidential cases into our tracking system, what we call the address system. That's our tracking review redaction system in the NDC. It's not surprising that every library did things just a little bit differently. Fortunately, most of the libraries, when they transferred their records to us, they transferred mostly Excel spreadsheets, and we were able to massage those and load those in, into our system. But for those, the 12 people I've got working for me now and the 19 people I hope a year from now, I can say what I've got working for me. It's still, it's still a big, um, big backlog. Let me see if I can find the backlog numbers here. So up until... Have lost the audio. I'm sorry, what? We lost the audio for a moment, but you're back now. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I will talk louder or talk more closely into the microphone. <laughs> I'm rarely accused of being soft spoken. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Um, I'm back. I'll have to get my train of thought back on track. Uh, backlog. So we've had this backlog, we've been reducing the backlog. Our current federal backlog of open FOIA and mandatory cases. It's about 760 cases, split roughly 50-50. The inherited or transferred presidential cases, once we got them put into our system, which was really a major task between my archive specialists and our IT support people, um, we have about 10,000 open cases, and over 9,000 of those are open mandatory declassification review requests. So going from you know about 350 mandatories to over 9000 is, is is a daunting challenge and i like to use a baseball analogy you know we're going to play the game the best we can with the players i've got on the field and i will also say that my staff is a staff of what i would consider all stars but as most of you all know you need nine players on the field to field a complete team. I've got all stars, but I feel like sometimes I'm fielding seven. So that, just to give you an idea of some of the challenges that we're facing. However, I think working cooperatively with our agency partners, working with our friends at presidential libraries and trying to leverage resources, if if you're already in the building and we're asking for an opinion on does this need to go to your agency for consult or even better you know we've got some agencies that are willing to give us a decision because the agency FOIA and mandatory review shops don't want to be bombarded necessarily because they've all got backlogs too so if we can use technology in the future if we can use already on-site resources, I think we can get those declassified and maybe redacted records back to the libraries, declassified and redacted federal records out to you guys, the research community. And as one of the pillars of NARA, whether you're the presidential, whether you're the federal side, we can do a better job of making access happen. And I look forward to questions from everybody. I'll turn it over to my friend, Carrie Lewis. 
right. Hello. First of all, it's good to be here and it's good to see so many uh, familiar faces out there. Um, so as Bill mentioned, I work at the ODNI and we have a unique um, situation, I think, in terms of the MDR process in that we don't have a huge backlog. And I think part of that is due to what Stephanie talked about with the public access requirements under the executive order. So I see or ODNI records are pretty highly classified. We don't typically talk about them much. So it's hard to identify a record to request, right? So what we find is requesters typically either request records that were created by a different agency uh, in our files, or they mine through congressional reports or press briefings to identify either topics on which they request reports or uh, what have you. But it's a, it's a fairly limited universe of records which are typically requested. Our process is essentially the same as, as what my colleagues kind of described. Maybe we would do a search for the records, compile everything, do an equity recognition review, identify all of the many agencies. And this is where ODNI is a bit unique in that we sit at the top of the IC. So almost every product that we produce is uh, derived from sources from a variety of different agencies or a host of different agencies, which require consultations with pretty much everybody. So we can identify the record, we can get, we can do that equity recognition review. And then the minute that we shoot it out to the agencies, we kind of lose control, right? And then it's up to the, to the agency to which we send it to, to, I, to do their process, some of which we've been informed uh, on occasion can take, like they'll tell us right off the bat, like we'll get this back to you in maybe a year, right? So, you know, it's one of those things where we cannot do much until we have those perspectives back. Um, and I think the other unique thing about ODNI is we're fairly young, right? We come to fruition really in 2005. Um, and so we are still operating under a classification guide, a security classification guide, as opposed to a declassification guide, which as Bill mentioned, kind of hits the scene and becomes the authority once a record turns 25. Um, and once that happens, I think that the criteria shifts, right? Like in terms of what is considered to still be sensitive um, past that that benchmark. So um, oftentimes, you know, we, we do what we can to reduce as much as we can and to, to provide as much out to the public as, as possible, being cognizant of the fact that the vast majority of the products that we produce are highly classified records. Um, I guess the one key challenge that we have, there's a few key challenges that we have, and a lot of it echoes uh, what my NARA colleagues had mentioned, <laughs> is you know being able to share information in a fast and efficient environment. We live on essentially the high side, as, as Don mentioned, um, and getting information to be able to share with our State Department colleagues or our DOD colleagues um, who live on a secret level network, it can be challenging to be able to do that in an electronic format, right? So again, to to my colleagues' points, right, it requires printing things off and putting them in snail mail and hoping that it gets received sometime in the next two months. Um, and then once it does, waiting for that, you know, waiting for the confirmation before we can even start really tracking it with another agency, which makes kind of emphasizing the necessity to get stuff back uh, a little bit challenging or requesting prioritization a little bit, uh, a little bit challenging. Um, so that, that is a, a challenge that I, I think supersedes us all, like, right? Like it's, it's one of those things that, that is, is costly, it is, is extremely uh, laborious, and it requires all agencies to kind of shift, to make a, a huge cultural shift, as well as a technological shift and an infrastructure shift that, again, is very costly. So, um, so we run into that barrier, we run into the challenge of, of, of butting up against agencies who have backlogs, which are extraordinary. And so getting agencies to prioritize our one request, even though it may be small or it might be, you know, might be tiny, <laughs> typically our, our, the knee jerk reaction is no, you know, you're in a queue and you'll get it when we get to that stage, which is understandable if at times a little bit maddening. Um, and then I guess the other thing that kind of we face in the ODNI is oftentimes once we receive everything back, it become it initiates a negotiation process, and I think that especially having served as an ice cap liaison for um, for the last few years, and and really being part of that deliberative process in which we engage on a very minute level, like on a on a word by word or sentence by sentence level, to try to slice redactions down as much as it is possible to do, um, and 
you know, once we get those consolidated redactions back, making sure whatever is possible to release is actually reflected in that record, again, can just add time. Because the minute that you go back to an agency, it's like, sure, we'll get to it when, we, when we're done with these other things, right? Um, but it's hard to provide a justification in advance. It's hard to anticipate what another agency will consider to be sensitive and then provide an argument ahead of, you know, ahead of the, of the curve um, to help that process along. So oftentimes it's really a process of you wait until you receive the redactions from another agency, you look and see what they took out and if there is any room for negotiation, if there's any way to say, listen, this, you know, information on this was released in the press or it was released by the White House, can we, can we release that in this, in this context? Um, again, it's time consuming, but it is one step that at least I personally feel is, is warranted to ensure that we do get information out into the public domain. Um, other than that, like really what we do really reflects the processes I think that, that have already been, been discussed. And just being mindful of time, I would like to at least cede some time to my, my OSD colleague. <laughs> ah, thanks, Carrie. Sure. Appreciate it. And Stephanie and Don. Um, uh, hello, uh, everyone. I'm glad to see such a high turnout here and hopefully in virtual land uh, for this event. Uh, I'd like to thank ISU and Dr. Carpenter for the invitation and opportunity to speak at events like these, um, which I hope are provide opportunities for discussion with the public um, and the promotion of transparency and understanding of the declassification activities of the U.S. government. It's very important uh, and informed citizenry. Um, again, I'm J.D. Smith. I'm the acting chief of the OSD, so Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, records uh, and declassification division. Um, I reside, uh, my office resides within a DOD component called Washington Headquarters Services, and we're in the Executive Services Directorate within the DOD component landscape. Um, I have supported this office in one capacity or another for the past 15 years, um, and as such, we serve as the program office, uh, as mentioned, as the OSD Records and Information Management Program, so the Records Office as well as the D-Class office for two OSD level programs, which is the OSD automatic uh, declassification review program and the OSD and joint staff mandatory declassification program. We have two DOD wide responsibilities and that is the DOD foreign relations of the United States declassification review with our partners at Department of State. And also with our partners at Department of State, we, are the, uh, we serve as the DOD NATO declassification uh, program. Um, we also serve as kind of the lead coordinating offices as designated by the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security for department-wide or DOD-wide or agency-wide activities, uh, declassification activities such as the Argentina Declassification Project and the uh, DOD's own El Mazote Declassification Project, which we concluded earlier this year. Um, so a lot of, a lot of hats. Um, we do this with a staff, uh, a total billeted staff of seven government personnel, um, seven. Uh, and one uh, of which my boss, Ms. Luz Ortiz, who is the OSD agency records officer, was recently promoted. So we will be backfilling uh, positions and uh, doing a lot of position moving. But um, I'd like to caveat further from here on out that my responses are not representative of the entire DOD or of the U.S. government. Uh, for perspective, I only serve as the program manager of the OSD and joint staff MDR program. There are 20 plus others in the Department of Defense alone, all their own individual programs with program managers like myself. Um, and I'm sure they don't want me speaking on their behalf. <laughs> so I would like to really caveat this as well. I, I am representing the Office of Secretary of Defense in, in this capacity and not DOD writ large. I do not represent DOD writ large. Um, from a statistical perspective, to give you all some perspective, our OSDJS uh, MDR program currently sits at about 2,600 active cases and about 137,000 total pages. We also have mixed media, such as videos, audio, et cetera, all, all, all mixed media types, which are comprised of direct requests from public requesters, as well as referrals received from the interagency uh, partners and uh, NARA and the presidential library system. Um, for historical perspective, our program's active high case watermark was a, sat around 6,700 cases in 2015. We had a concerted effort to apply resourcing we have money, personnel, contract personnel, and since then we've worked that down. I'm very proud uh, to be a part of that, to that 2,600 figure that you see today. So it proves to us that with investment and prioritization, backlogs can get handled, but that does take senior leader intervention. Um, so uh, lastly, uh, also from a 
transparency and declassification determination perspective, historically, our program maintains an average declass in full rate of 70%. So that's historically for our program. So we do release a lot more than you think uh, for those public requesters out there. It's just some requesters actively request highly sensitive war plan, nuclear war planning uh, type documents that will be and continue to remain protected in redacted and sanitized form. Um, to conclude, I want to leave the audience with this sentiment here that the folks that work for our program are extremely passionate. Um, we are hardworking professionals that deeply care about the customers, which is the U.S. public. Uh, we deeply value our position as being on the front lines and the vanguard of transparency, of which transparency and an informed republic are cornerstones of accountability and the democratic ideals of the United States. We, it's, it's a unique position that we find ourselves in. Um, however, inherent with this position is a duty and responsibility to protect and withhold valid classified and sensitive information, which if released could cause real danger and damage, not only to US in, uh, initiatives, but to personnel. Um, so I, I wanna leave you all with that sentiment. I'm, I'm proud to be here and with our colleagues, uh, uh, just for those here, we all work extensively yeah, together. Yes. It's not <laughs> we probably a week that we don't all email each other to include Bill uh, about all cross ranging initiatives and things we're working on. And as well as, as, well as individual NDR cases in the case of uh, Stephanie, Don, me and Carrie pretty much every week. Um, thank you, and the, the, my, my, my remarks are concluded. Well, thank you. Well, well thank you, panelists, for speaking. I'll clap for you. <laughs> now, so to maximize time, to maximize time and participation from you all, we're going to forego talking among ourselves with the panel. But I will introduce William Burr for commentary. So Dr. Burr is an archives senior analyst. He's been a senior analyst at the National Security Archives since 1990. He directs the archives nuclear security documentation project and has led the collection and editorial work to create the award-winning online site, The Nuclear Vault. He received his PhD in US history from Northern Illinois University. He has served as the archives overall freedom of information coordinator before launching consecutively the archives research projects on Berlin crisis and nuclear weapons documentation. His articles have appeared in Diplomatic History, Cold War, International History Project Bulletin, International Security, International History Review, and the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, among other publications. 2015, he published his latest book with Jeffrey P. Kimball, Nixon's Nuclear Spectre, The Secret Alert of 1969, Madman Diplomacy in the Vietnam War. Please welcome Bill. And he's a, he's a frequent ice cap uh, uh, appellant and all around observant person. Please welcome Bill Burke. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. We don't have a lot of time for discussion, so I'll cut short my presentation somewhat because there should be some time for, for people to ask questions. So thanks for the invitation to be on this excellent panel. I have some comments about how the MDR system developed over the years and why it is not living up to its full potential in certain respects. I mean, that is mainly because at present, there is no effective final appeal. For years, MDR has been a productive method for getting national security information declassified, but has become somewhat less so in some areas for reasons unrelated to its merits, because MDR is a, a good system. Now, created during the Nixon administration, you know, we know it's obligatory for some presidential records and for donated records like Robert McNamara's up in College Park. But it also can be used for, our, for requesting just about any identifiable agency record that fits the MDR parameters from CIA for defense, not just the archives, but the agencies as such. Now, thanks to the ingenuity of the late Steve Garfinkel, the Clinton executive order established ISCAP as a vehicle for considering agents for considering appeals denied by the agencies or by at NARA. Of course, by contrast, as, as Mr. Bradley mentioned, FOIA provides, FOIA provides no final appeal, just the possibility of litigation. Of course, the possibility of litigation makes FOIA a powerful tool for open government and accountability, but it's not practical in most cases. So we have MDR but we have a final appeal, and that's given MDR an edge as an alternative to FOIA for making requests for national security information, especially on more difficult topics, intelligence or nuclear, whatever. 
So when it began its work in the late 1990s, ISCAP lived up to its potential by making innovative decisions on a variety of challenging, and sensitive intelligence, nuclear, and other issues. Um, I won't give examples because they're all on the, on the website. Now, because ISCAP has operated on a majority rule basis, the members could and did override agencies that were doggedly classifying information that was arguably, arguably no longer sensitive. Of course, ISCAP has its limits. We can't get it, we can't review legislatively exempted information like CIA information or former restricted data and so forth. So there's limits, but it's done much good. But as sometimes happens in life, it became a victim of its success. During the decades of the two tens, of the de during the decades of the two tens, we know it became overwhelmed with appeals, and, and we've heard twelve hundred outstanding cases. They're still on the books. Um, so this backlog is an important shortcoming of the MDR system because it means that the, the final appeal doesn't really work in any reasonable amount of time. Of course, the pandemic shutdown compounded the backlog. It was necessary and unavoidable, but it went hand in hand with what looks like, at least from my perspective, sort of a near collapse of the declassification system, 2019, 2000, 2020, 2021. So with all that behind it, I don't see how ISCAP can tackle the backlog with the resources that it has at hand. So this is nothing new to any of you. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful fact. So there's a, ISCAP has a bare bone staff and it faces a significant technology deficit that we've heard. There's no means to send classified documents by email. There's problems holding classified conferences at NARA. NARA lacks the technology. So if I just got to do its job properly, it's got to have more funding, it's got to have more staff. And of course, where that's going to come from, who knows? But it's a, it's a fact that it's, there's, it's, it can't do its job properly and catch up with the back backlog and any kind of you know, 10% of the cases, like Don's saying, well, it'd be nice to get a 10% every year of the backlog. That would make, make a difference, but who knows? So expanding staffs would be helpful. Improving the rules would be helpful. For example, giving the MDC more authority in declassification decisions and appeals at NARA would be very useful. You know, I would support that, I think. And especially with all the presidential records coming in, thousands and millions of pages of presidential records. I mean, NARA, could, NARA and NDC could chip away a little bit at that bottom, a huge pile of presidential records. But unless there's an effort at systematic review to review those records from Truman through Eisenhower and forward, year by year to review that mass of records, you know, MD, the MDR process is not going to help get access to those records. So there needs to be a major major funding for systematic review at NARA. There used to be systematic review back in the 90s and 2010s, but it's, it ended. Uh, so that's gonna be considered because without systematic review, those records are gonna be unavailable for the most part for our lifetimes and longer. Uh, now, I have, if there are better if the ex executive orders under, under review, as we've heard, I think there are better rules that could help with eliminating backlogs and eliminating, eliminating overclassification. And I have suggestions, but I'm not gonna go into those because if you look at the, at the website of the National History Coalition or the Twitter feed of the National Security Archive, you will see recommendations that were recently made by diplomatic historians and National Security Archive and the History Coalition for improving the executive order. So I won't go over them point by point. Um, but involves like tightening up the use of discretionary exemptions, tightening up the rules for 50 year old documents. Because under the rules, the agencies can, can ask for exemptions, but that could be tightened up quite a bit to make it more difficult for agencies to classify records after 50 years old. Um, there are other reforms I have in mind, you know, drop dead dates. 
have to drop that date for a new classified documents. The backlogs in the future would not appear, but there are no drop dead dates at present, as far as I can tell. So I conclude by stating my main point that as long as there's no effective final appeal for the agency, for agency denials, using MDR will not be an entirely reliable method for seeking the classification of national security information. So, if I set to be expanded and revived, that would make a big difference, but time will tell about the possibilities. But thank you for your patience. Now we have more time for discussion. Thank you, Bill. So we will alternate our questions from you all here and our remote audience who will submit questions via the chat function at WebEx. We do have a microphone. So if you would like to speak, I'll put the microphone in the center. And if you speak into the microphone, the remote participants can hear you. You don't have to be on camera though. <laughs> Any questions from you all? Oh, please introduce yourself if you like. Michael Ravnitsky, I'm from the researcher community. And I appreciate the work that uh, ISU does and ICECAP. I, in fact, I tell a lot of my colleagues who, uh, who are also researchers that uh, I, NARA is our friend and hopefully ICECAP and ISU is our friend as well. Uh, but there, one thing that uh, has been troubling is that there are hundreds of cases listed on the docket, on ICECAP's docket, that for which the records have been not yet provided by the agencies. And I don't know if that's because ICECAP is not ready to get the doc documents yet, or because the agencies have been intransigent, or because they can't find them, or some other reason. And it would be helpful for transparency to learn more about that delay in the agencies providing records uh, so that ICECAP can begin the evaluation and review process. Okay, thank so, you. Well, thank you. That's, that's a relatively straightforward question to answer. So the, you'll notice on the the status log that we have on our website, the, the records requested from uh, from the agency. Uh, the ICECAP has not received responses from hundreds of appeals because those it's not productive for the ICECAP staff to do so. So for those many, many appeals for those DOD command reports that are being processed in the combatant commands or in the, in the components, there's no value in the ICECAP receiving those records yet. Uh, so that's the that's the, the vast majority of the no records uh, the records requested there are other other considerations something strange happened uh agencies are having a hard time finding the request uh it could be an the uh a neither confirm nor deny one of those glomar responses and the agency can't really provide records the best they can do is provide us a justification and periodically we do we do go back to agencies to to uh, gather that so if you see that status for your for your request, it doesn't mean that the agency is stonewalling or is thumbing their nose at the ice cap. It means either it's not productive to send that to the ice cap staff yet, or there's something peculiar happening. And we do our best to sort out those peculiar issues. Questions from the remote world. Oh, JD, please uh, hand your your. Uh, very direct question. Why is ICECAP so slow in processing MDR appeals? Oh. Uh, Carrie, would you like to answer that? <laughs> oh my God, I would love that. Thank you so much because I think I'm probably half the problem. <laughs> so the, uh, the ICECAP process in just in a sort of short snapshot is that we receive the records. Um, and if there are agency redactions, you know, um, First of all, that's a great step, right? Because then we have something to actually look at and start to adjudicate. In some cases, if an agency has failed to respond, right, we get the blank documents, or if something was denied in full, we get the we get the clean copy of the documents and we set forward. And some of these documents are really short and never easy because if they're I feel like if they're shorter, oftentimes they're far more complicated or they're pretty long and lengthy. Either way, we sit down and I, I speak only for me, not for my ICAP colleagues, but I know they also go through the same process. So um, and we read every single word of these of these documents and we spend an awful lot of time looking at uh, what has been previously declassified on this situation, right? Um, 
and so Bill had mentioned hearts and minds. Uh, I can tell you, I spent an awful lot of time looking through the National Security Archive website and other uh, publicly declassified uh, repositories of records to see what specifically had been declassified on the entire 300 plus pages worth of text that had been included in this. And, and then taking that knowledge and reviewing what is what is still considered to be a sensitive either source or method or um, forward relationship or what have you, right? And making recommendations. And that is extraordinarily time consuming. It does not happen quickly. It also, we then go to the meetings every month and sit around a, a round table and deliberate how to best protect that must, which must be protected and to release everything that we possibly can. Um, and a lot of it is a, is a back and forth and a negotiation in which we start off with, just for fun, a redacted paragraph, and then we try to slice that down as much as possible to redact only a few words or a sentence or so. Um, and then what typically happens there is the agency, which either denied the information the first time or which is the equity holding agency, will take that information back. They send it to their SMEs or their subject matter experts who determine whether or not our redactions are adequate or appropriate. Um, in the context of what they determine to be sensitive. And again, it's a back and forth, right? Like they provide their recommendations to us. We then sit around and determine whether or not that, that fits what we believe is the appropriate action on this document. And then once all of that concludes and, and all agencies are in alignment, then we can make that final vote. Um, and even when it gets really close to the end zone. <laughs> there have been several instances I know where we've gotten something where it's like, oh, we think where this is pretty much ready for an ice cap vote. And then looking at it, it's like, well, but since we've already released all this over here and, and I just saw this posted over here, so what do you think if we can, can we just get this other redaction down? And then it, the whole process starts again. So it, it is, I think declassification in general, having worked in the belly of this beast for the better part of my career, it's a, it should be time consuming because you want to make sure that it is not a knee jerk no, right? Or a knee jerk, okay, we're gonna take the whole paragraph rather than try to figure out what we can release here. And that requires time. It requires engagement. It requires making sure that everybody who is, in, who is involved in, this, in the, the information is okay with it. And some of that requires justification. Some of that requires negotiation. Some of that just requires bullheaded, like, nope, <laughs> we're still not okay with it, right? Um, and then once we've concluded every uh, all of our deliberations, then we pass that forward and it goes to a vote. Um, and our, our members, so we work at the liaison level um, and then it goes to the member vote, um, which again, just sort of adds to the time. But I, I guess as we look through each one of these, um, each record, we really do put an awful lot of thought and a lot of time and a lot of investment in, in research uh, to, to make sure that the final product that goes forward is as transparent as it is possible to be. Thank you. More questions from the live audience? I'm afraid I have one more question, Michael Ravnitsky. Uh, so could you give me any insight or could you give us any insight into the uh, National Security Council IPC group that's evaluating the executive order and and uh, maybe not with specifics about what they're talking about, but just the process and and the 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 gate to gauge the length of time it might take to come out with something. And would there be a draft issued before the final is put out so that there can be a, some opportunity for some input? I understand it's not subject to the normal public comment and so on. Thank you. Yeah, that's 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 a, that's a tough one. So the the, the process is, is a National Security Council is a White House process for policy development. And that process is protected by executive privilege and it's let alone the classification issue. So there's very little I can say about that. It, it's it's happening. It's it's ongoing. Uh, it takes a long time and it's complicated. And it's unlikely that the, that the public will see very much until the whole until the, the executive order is published. But again, I'm that's that's I'm 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 speaking as somebody who, who sees it from the from the very um, far out periphery. Questions from the online community. Somebody had a question for uh, Stephanie. I believe we had a little bit of an IT issue where it cut out when you're speaking and they were wondering if you could, um, uh, you, you made a comment about the Reagan and Ford exemptions while talking about the 1978 ruling and they were wondering if you could just repeat that. 
repeat that again. The Reagan. The, yeah. The, uh, oh, Reagan forward. Reagan oh, forward. I you said forward. 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 I think, forward, okay. I think okay. is what. Yeah. Um, so. What I was talking about specifically is the 1978 Presidential Records Act. Uh, prior to that act, presidential papers were considered personal property. And so the presidents could do what they will with, the, with that material. And Roosevelt, President FDR Roosevelt decided to um, donate his papers to the National Archives setting up the presidential library system. Hoover thought that was a great idea. He decided, and then subsequent presidents had donated. Obviously, there was um, issues with President Nixon. And so as a result of that, um, we have the Presidential Records Act. And what, why it is important in talking about MDR is for those presidential papers that are not covered by the Presidential Records Act, they are donated historical materials. So the Freedom of Information Act does not apply. And so the only way um, the public can request access to those closed classified papers are through the mandatory declassification review process versus the Reagan administration forward because once the um, PRA, Presidential Records Act was passed, uh, President Carter was in office at the time and he was grandfathered in. So the PRA does not cover his materials, but he did donate his papers to um, the government. And so for Reagan Ford, people can file for, um, FOIA requests as well as MDR requests. And the other big thing is the, the um, mandatory notification period in the PRA. So at any point that the National Archives wants to release presidential records, Reagan Ford, we have to notify the incumbent and the um, former president, and they have a 60 working day period in which they can request um, access to the records to review them for a potential assertion of executive privilege. And they do have an opportunity to ask for a one-time 30 working day ex extension on that review period. Questions from the audience, please. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Gerstein with Politico. Um, I have a question, Mr. Carpenter. You said you welcome the process kind of being pushed back towards the agencies. Uh, it seems that the, the ISCAP is uh, proactive in releasing a log of all of its pending cases. Uh, are the agencies equally proactive in releasing logs of their pending MDR cases? Um, I, I've found just personally to have had some difficulty where agencies don't even use tracking numbers for their MDR cases. So I don't imagine it would be terribly easy for them to tally them up, but um, wouldn't it be useful to have that level of transparency? The agencies here all release their pending MDR logs as well, just like the ice cap does. Yeah, that, that's a, that's an interesting question. So that would, that would be something that could come up during the, the ISU MDR oversight initiative that we talked about. So, so a best practice across the government could be for agencies to be more, more, transparent about the requests that are coming in. So there's no reason for them not to be. Um, FOIA logs, for example, those are often, uh, those are made available to the public. Uh, there's really nothing stopping MDR requests from being from being made available. So the public can see where the requests are in relation to others. It's a good idea. Questions from the world? Do you see ICECAP using AI technologies such as a closed area chapped GPT agent to accelerate the process. Interesting. Uh, AI for ice guy. No, that would be a, that would be a big no. But, but of course, the, but where where artificial intelligence could be put in place is for is for that first level of use from you know for, from from systems of records, systems of electronic records through an automated review process to identify, you know, through intelligent machine learning, uh, sensitive stuff, screening. Uh, being used as a, as a weeding process. There's the, there's, that certainly makes a lot of sense. But the ice cap process, probably not. Questions from our, from our group, please. Hello. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, my question is, given what's uh, happened with um, the Trump records, the Pence uh, stuff. Have there been discussions even high up about reevaluating or the or updating the Presidential Records Act given all that's uh, happened? 
Um, yes, there have been discussions, not that I'm privy to, but definitely there are um, congressmen, uh, senators on the Hill who have actually proposed legislation, are drafting legislation. And so there is that thought that yes, the Presidential Records Act um, could do with a revision. The last um, uh, update to the Presidential Records Act was 2014. And part of that was just codifying the no notification process that I just mentioned. But um, in terms of internal discussions, none that I know of, but on the Hill, there have been people who have been quite um, quite uh, transparent with their desire to update that. I think we have time for for at least one more from the from the outside world. Does ICECAP have ideas on how to how it will grapple with classified projects that involve corporations, such as still classified aircraft programs that will eventually get publicly released? Oh, does the ice cap have a, have a process for that? Um, yes. Yeah, classified aircraft programs. So, of course, aircraft have long lives. B-52, for example, has been flying for for what, what, six, seven, 70 plus years. Uh, there's iterations of the B-52 that um, are, that contain classified. They're, they're exempt from auto class in 50 years. Mr. Burke. The whole issue of contract studies like RAND Corporation, so they're not, not accessible to the employee or MDR, unless the agencies actually have them. That's right. Because the big problem is they're getting all this public money. They do classified studies, but there's no accountability. So Dr. Burr's question had to do with, with yeah. collections out there. In the, like Even the federally funded research and development centers, there, there, are, there are classified collections of those places, not subject to automatic declassification. The only way to, to get material out is through the mandatory declassification review process, which is, as we know, is, is overburdened. So it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, so for, for the classified corporate records done under a government contract, those records are subject to the National Industrial Security Program, which essentially requires agencies to provide declassification guidance. Uh, there's no s real system for that. It would have to be done on an individual basis, as it's done now, and it's not efficient. The results in agencies be required to keep material, in, in corporations required to keep material classified or destroy it. And as, as, as Mr. Burr, Dr. Burr mentioned, often those studies might not be available elsewhere anyway, in, in any form. We are past our 2.30 time. Any of our panelists have any last words? No. Go uh, I, I was just going to say thank you for the questions. Thank you for your continued interest. And just kind of a parting idea from me, not necessarily representing the National Declassification Center. If we don't rigorously review historical archival materials, with an aim of releasing all that we can and protecting just what we must, we in many ways undermine those secrets that need to stay secret. If everything is secret, well, is really anything secret? So I, I encourage my agency colleagues, especially when looking through that historical lens to, and Carrie mentioned this with you know the ice caps, very careful deliberations to think what can we release and what must we still protect? I think you know smart people might have different views on that, but using that magnifying glass every time we're doing an MDR review on historical records is valuable. But thank you guys for coming. I appreciate seeing so many folks here. Well, thank you, Don. And that concludes our day. So thank you very much. And thank you all.